Thanks, everybody. Now, yeah, yeah. I, I play only an ornamental role this morning, so which is my, usually my wife laughs uproariously when I say that. Uh, welcome, everybody. Glad to have you here. Um, I, uh, this is a part of the Military Strategy Forum, and I want to say sincere thanks to our friends at, at Rolls-Royce that are able, they make it possible for us to bring this to the policy community. Uh, I, from my recollection, I think this is the first time that we've had the, the Chief of the Guard Bureau. Um, and I'm glad for that. Uh, now, part of it, I think it's quite opportune from a timing standpoint, because uh, as everybody knows, there is a giant war being fought every day. Uh, it's inside the Pentagon, and it's over money. Um, this happens. Uh, it, it happened a lot when I was over there. Uh, it's quite intense now because we're in this, uh, well, we don't have a national debate. I'm frustrated by that. There should be a national debate over what we're doing. I mean, we are just having a lopsided discussion where, uh, where we don't really have the substance uh, brought to the table about the meaning of cutting these budgets. And it's, it's, I think we have to be honest to say there's great damage that's being done to the Defense Department these days. Uh, I had breakfast this morning with a very senior guy with the intelligence community. I'm alarmed at what's happening in the intelligence community. But it isn't a broad debate that we're having, uh, and that's part of what we're doing today is to try to stimulate that debate. But we're also taking a, a, a special focus on the role of the reserve components, uh, the Guard and the reserves. And uh, this, as everyone knows, is a long-standing source of, of both strength but tension. Uh, in, in the department. Uh, I grew up in a little town, every day walked past the guard armory to go to school. I grew up having the guard. It was a presence in my life when I was a kid. Uh, it's, uh, we had to close the guard unit. You know, now everybody has to drive 30 miles you know, to get to their guard unit. We lost ours, but, uh, but we had our own guard unit and it was part of the cultural fabric of my hometown. And I remember back when, when we went to war in Iraq uh, back in 1991, you know, the president sent uh, the Defense Department to war in August. But America didn't go to war until January. And that was when all of the guard units around the country were being mobilized. Um, we'd go down to the courthouse uh, families would tie little yellow ribbons, you know, or on trees, because their unit, their, their guardsmen went, okay? That was when America went to war. And it's one of the things that, honestly, the active military doesn't appreciate. They don't understand how profoundly the Guard and the Reserves connect America to the military. We've become a small military, relatively. You know, it, it, the communities that routinely see people in uniform are not quite few. We don't routinely see this in America. You see it in Washington. But you just, you know, you, you go, I go back to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, you don't see guys walking around in uniform. You go most places, you don't see them walking in uniform. If you do, they're guardsmen. Now, the significance of that is this is a way that America stays connected uh, with its military. Now, it's a source of frustration for our active duty friends, our active duty components, because they see themselves in a very different way. They see themselves as being at work every day defending the country, and they look at the Guard as being defending the country on weekends. Okay? It's, not, it's not true. Guardsmen are out every day. I think if you, one of the histories of these last 10 years is the remarkable, the remarkable capacity of the reserve components to step up to this fight. Uh, four or five times when I got to Iraq, you couldn't tell. You couldn't tell who was active and who was reserved. So it was a remarkable thing that's accomplished. Now, I'd also have to say to my good friends in the reserve components, you couldn't exist without the active duty. The active duty is a foundation for it. It's essential that this be a constructive partnership. And if we continue to have what's a divisive and, and brutal battle over the edges of the problem, we're going to undermine what's essential to the whole. 
So the purpose of this, and the purpose to have you, General Grass, was to bring this perspective, because I know your spirit, and you're a member of the Joint Chiefs now, and you are sitting there side by side working with your counterparts on all of the issues, not just guard issues. And this is, I think, part of what's going to heal us together when we go through these wrenching debates, which we're having right now on how we're going to resource the reserve components in the whole as we design a strategy for all of us. So I'm grateful to have you here. General, would you please join me? And would you please, with your applause, welcome General Frank Grass. Dr. Henry, thank you so much. Uh, uh, your, your comments were right on track uh, with, with what we're dealing with today. And I do appreciate the opportunity to be here with such a distinguished audience. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, it's not that often you get a chance to talk to folks from all different, different disciplines uh, that uh, may not necessarily know who the Guard is today, or you may have a lot of involvement with the Guard or the Reserve. But uh, I see it as a great opportunity to talk with you, and then hopefully you'll take away from this discussion as well as the panel session uh, some great, great uh, think pieces for the future. Um, I think that is something that we need input from a lot of different uh, segments of, uh, of our think tanks, definitely, as well as uh, you know what we deal in every day in the Pentagon, us in uniform. Uh, we have to think out of the box these days of, of where we're going for the future. I wanted to start out, though, uh, as I look through the distinguished audience and the backgrounds and, and where you all come from. And I thought it might be worthwhile for me to start by talking about who the National Guard is, where do we come from, and a little bit about what was happening pre-9-11 with the Guard, because we were going in the 80s and 90s going through a transformation a bit. And that was quite accelerated after 9-11 and some of the missions that we, we do today. But then we're going to need to change for the future. And that's really where I look forward to your comments, your help for the future of, of how should we change? How should the active and the guard, the reserve mix come out of this in the end and, and take away from our last 12 years of experience and cost savings and say, okay, what's the right mix of your active component versus your reserve component going to the future? I thought I would start out just, just some real basic numbers. Uh, National Guard was stood up 376 years ago. Massachusetts Bay Colonies, the militia, to defend their homelands, to be able to, you know, to fight. And uh, small, small companies were stood up at that time. So we tie back our, our grounding uh, to that organization up on the Northeast, and we spread eventually to all 54 states, territories in the District of Columbia. The numbers today, uh, we were at 358,000 Army Guardsmen, that number is going to go down to 350,200 uh, as a part of the drawdown. Uh, 350,000 right around there is where we were pre-9-11, so we're going back to about where we were. If you look at the historical trends, uh, the Guard set at about 350 for probably the last two to three decades right around there. It, it bumped up and down a little bit here and there, but for the most part, around 350, maybe a little above that. On the Air Guard side, uh, they were at 105,700 as a part of the 13 budget discussions, and some of you have heard the debate that's going on, and there's a Senate commission going on right now. Uh, that number will go down to 105,400. The interesting thing, as Dr. Hamry said, though, is we are still in close to 3,000 communities across the nation. So when you mobilize the Guard, you're touching the communities. Everyone knows someone from their hometown. And I had the opportunity in the last few weeks to go out, and I, I went out to uh, Moore, Oklahoma, and walked the, the, the devastated area of the, of the tornado went through and where the children were killed in the, uh, the school, and talked to residents. And uh, Governor Fallon, she was with me all afternoon, and the adjutant general. But everywhere we went, people were thanking the guard for, for coming in and supporting the first responders. Of course, we made it very clear that the lead, the lead organization there was the fire chief and the police chief and the ambulance and the hospitals. But our folks were there and everyone knew someone. They knew Specialist Smith from down the street that immediately put on his uniform and showed up at his armory ready to go. You know, they knew uh, Specialist Jones and Sergeant Aurora and all those names. Uh, they came in right away, 
left their jobs. They knew there was a devastation that uh, would require the guard to be used. And Governor Fallon basically had announced right off the bat uh, to the Adjutant General Miles During, move in, get ready to go, but coordinate it closely with the state emergency managers as well as with the locals. So when you touch the community like that, that's the foundation. As Dr. Hamry said, people knew those armories, knew where those people were from. Uh, I went up to Boston and uh, met with uh, Governor Patrick, and we talked through how you respond to something like a Boston event, a bombing. And uh, the city of Boston, very proud first responders, great police force. But how do, you, how do you bring in the guard to support that? And then how do you do it without pushing too far? And it starts with advice, advice from the governor, advice from the adjutant general. And we had 450 uh, National Guardsmen supporting the marathon. We had some that were actually marching the marathon with their rucksacks, and they immediately switched gears from either a security force or a, uh, a participant marching in the marathon to a responder, and they stepped right out. But it was their hometown. It was the people they grew up with that they were responding to. So that brings in that close tie that, that there's no way you can ever replace that. Uh, if you lose it. So I think, you know, the 3,000 communities that we touch are extremely important. Wanted to talk briefly about our pre-9-11 posture and our, how we, in probably the 80s, we began to transition a bit. Uh, in the 80s, we started to see some of our first equipment modernization in the guard. We also began to see our regional training institute stand up, 80s and 90s. We saw overseas deployment opportunities. Uh, example, 1985, National Guard Task Force Minuteman into Panama. 1986, uh, Task Force Big Bear going into Honduras to do infrastructure, to do medical support to the, to the population, to work with either those militaries or those defense forces or the Ministry of Education or Health of those organizations. We did the logistics of that to build the base camp. So in the mid 80s, we started to transition from a strategic reserve to being more operational and having the opportunity to pack up everything from a hometown and figure out a way how to get it, you know, three, 4,000 miles away by ship, by air, by land clearing customs, moving into an area and establishing a base camp in a foreign nation, working with that nation to produce a humanitarian product in the end to leave it there. So I look back at that and uh, on 9-11, shortly after 9-11, when we first started mobilizing, I remembered making calls to some units that had not deployed. They usually did their drills or their annual training in a close by training area. And I would call those that had deployed number of times into Central and South America, a couple cases even into Africa. And it was pretty interesting to see those that had deployed, the first question you got, okay, what's my timeline? Where's my budget? You know, what's my lift going to be? Those that hadn't left and had been at Camp Swampy, you know, in state training area for the last 20 years, was the first words were usually, oh, shit, what do we got ourselves into? But it, it was that, that mindset that we created by having those operational uh, deployment opportunities. In addition, in the 80s and 90s, especially in the 90s, we had the opportunity to deploy to combat training centers. Combat training centers being the National Training Center and the Joint Readiness Training Center, and send brigades. And our enhanced brigades had an opportunity to plan and execute a deployment and do an operational mission in a training status that gave them value and grew leaders like we never had before at the brigade level. So I see that as some of the change from a strategic reserve pointing us in the direction of an operational force in the Guard. A couple of unique programs that uh, we started in the 80s and 90s, the State Partnership Program. Uh, some of you may be aware of it, where we partner a nation with a state uh, this really came out of uh, the fall of the Soviet Union and up in the, uh, throughout Europe, uh, a lot of countries wanted to partner with somebody. Uh, the first three were Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and we aligned them with states 
Some had similar backgrounds. Uh, Poland wanted a partner. We aligned them with Illinois using the cultural diversity and background that, that comes with that. Uh, today we have 65 state partners. Some states have two. And uh, many of them have deployed together. But that program started really in, in about 92, 93 time frame. So some of them have been on with us now for 20 years. Very unique, but it provided an opportunity for a country to align with a state and then eventually get into NATO, many of these countries. And then today, some of them are deployed. I'll give you an example. Maryland is partnered with Estonia and Bosnia. Uh, I was just up at the State House with Governor O'Malley and the Adjutant General. Uh, Minister of Defense of Bosnia was there. Minister of Defense of uh, Estonia was there. Estonia was celebrating their 20th year of their partnership, Bosnia their 10th. Right now, Bosnia has an MP platoon embedded in the MP company of the Maryland National Guard in Afghanistan. I can give you hundreds of, of uh, deployments like that that we've done with many countries now where we're actually taking countries that were consumers of security 20 years ago now, uh, 10 years ago, that are now producers of security and they want to continue to progress. And it's that partnership, that hometown relationship. And uh, I'll give you one example uh, on the state partnership that uh, pays us huge benefits. And oh, by the way, the whole thing for 65 state partners cost about $14 million a year. And it is the one program that continues to do well in, in the budget discussions. But to give you an example, I had an adjutant general come to me one day, and he had had a long-standing partnership with the chief of defense and the minister of defense. And they had just assigned a new combatant commander to that uh, combatant command. And the first call the minister made was to the adjutant general, who he had known probably since he was a lieutenant colonel, now a two-star in the state. And he says, what can you tell me about this guy? What do I need to know about this combatant commander? You know, how will he work for us? When do I need to go see him? What should I focus on for our country to be a part of, of this combatant command? So it tells you the long ties they've created. Uh, the current Adjutant General of Maryland, uh, General Jim Adkins, he was a Lieutenant Colonel, one of the first US officers to go into Estonia uh, after the wall fell. And now he's the Adjutant General. Uh, so, creates deep ties that you can only get with a foundation that stays with you for that long. And because of a Guard being a community-based organization, uh, we're able to do that. A couple other programs that began, and, and maybe even further back, but uh, the counter-drug program, where each state supports local law enforcement uh, agencies. They support the southwest border. Uh, each state provides uh, aviation support to state police. Whatever the state may need, uh, we have a counter-drug program that is funded to uh, support uh, first responders, uh, as well as uh, we also have a training program to train county, local municipality police on counter-drug. And those programs, we, we provide the facility, and the trainers actually come in from DEA, from NARCs, from uh, some of the bigger communities within the regions. And uh, the counter-drug program has been very successful for us. It, it's been successful for hometown America, where you have very limited resources in some areas. And uh, that program uh, is constantly under, under threat because of the budget issues. And one other program that I will mention that really came out of the 80s and 90s was the Youth Challenge program. Uh, youth Challenge is where we take at-risk youth. Uh, we work with the school, state school system. Uh, the states have to pay 25 percent of the cost. We get 75 percent to run a logistics setup. So we may take an installation. I was recently visiting uh, the DC Guard here. They use their armory as a base and they bring these students in. Uh, we provide almost like a drill sergeant uh, for five months and these are at-risk youth. They can't have any felonies but they're at-risk youth and we run them through. We provide the discipline and then the school system comes in and gets them through a GED. Most of them are 16, 17, 18 year olds that probably would end up in the, you know, in the, uh, the, the court system at some point if we didn't do something for these young folks. So that program that started in the probably more, more ramped up in the 90s is still in existence today. Not all states have it. They don't have the funds in some cases, but uh, it's a great opportunity for the guard, again, through hometown America to help out those communities. And there's some tremendous success stories, and some of you may have been to the gala here that we host every year in February, but there's some tremendous success stories about an individual who would tell you they were on path, uh, you know, to end up in jail. 
and today they're productive members of society, uh, very well educated. Uh, so it's a part of a mission that fits well in our community-based organization. On federal missions in pre-9-11, uh, we were doing, as I mentioned earlier, desert, uh, the, uh, some of the missions in Balkans as well as the missions that we supported uh, under the no-fly zone. And, but it was very small, two to 3,000 a year being mobilized for those missions. We did deploy to Desert Storm, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. We had troops, we had an MP platoon in just cause, but most of it were very small units and not for very long time frames. So a very small portion of our population actually had the opportunity to mobilize. And I gave you the numbers up front. If you think about today, 460,000 Army and Air Guardsmen, and at that time a couple, two or 3,000 a year getting a chance to deploy was a very small number. In addition to that, though, our Air National Guard, uh, dating back into the 70s, uh, actually before that, probably even as late as uh, the late 50s under the NORAD agreement, uh, doing air control alert over the United States. Uh, today, there's 40 fighters, seven tankers, and a couple of AWACS. 95% of that capability setting alert today comes out of the Air National Guard. And uh, we've been doing that mission for a long time. And again, through the 80s and 90s, we continued to hone that. And our, our uh, folks do that very well, working with uh, under the direction, under the command and control of North American Aerospace Defense Command. In the 80s and 90s, our state active duty missions had little interaction with the federal side for the most part. There was no NORTHCOM. There wasn't a J-34 in the Pentagon. There wasn't an ASDHD uh, Assistant Secretary for Homeland Defense. So we were pretty much internal. We knew we had to get beyond uh, being able to respond just to a state disaster. We had to ramp that up. So we established, I say we, the states established a thing called Emergency Management Assistance Compacts so that they could bring in civilian assets from one state to another, an agreement between two governors and two attorney generals. But then we included in that the National Guard. So if you're in New Jersey and you get hit by a hurricane and there's a capability that doesn't reside in your state, let's say you don't have the engineer capability you need or the medical, you can reach out to the surrounding states. Or you can reach out halfway across the country if you want. You can reach to any state as long as the governor is willing to release those forces and move in to assist. So that's really the, the foundation of the emergency management compacts, which today we use uh, quite frequently. But again, there was very little interaction on the federal and state. I think Hurricane Andrew was the largest interaction, but it wasn't, it wasn't synchronized as unity of effort and unity of command at that point. I'll come back to that later. Uh, post 9-11. Uh, I, was, I was the ops chief for the Army National Guard over here in Arlington. Again, you've seen kind of what we were doing pre-9-11. Uh, didn't realize what had happened as the buildings uh, started to fall. I just knew that something was changing. Uh, General Roger Schultz was my boss. He came in and said, this is going to change who we are for the future. And I tried to think and grasp that. And somebody said, yep, get ready to mobilize. Get ready to deploy. And oh, by the way, uh, by next week, you've got to have 6,000 guardsmen in the airports. 6,000 right off the bat. Uh, what status will they be in? Who's going to pay the bill? What do they need to be equipped with? What are the rules of engagement? Those are all the kind of things that we went through early on. Uh, 150 active installations across the U.S. needed to be closed because we were a very open military. And many of you, you could drive right through the gates. You know, go to Fort Myers and drive right on through. Nobody stops you. You can go up to the general's house if you want. Nobody will stop you. So all of those installations, those depots, uh, those uh, storage sites for ammunition, all of that had to be closed. That took upwards of 10,000 troops at the peak when we actually added in Europe at the time, too, because many of the installations at Europe did not have the manpower to close those installations. So we mobilized for that in Title X federal duty. The state in the airports, we mobilized those forces, but the adjutant generals did it, and they received the money from the federal government, but the forces stayed under their command and control of the governor. Very unique. Later on, we had this thing called Winter Freeze, Operation Winter Freeze, and uh, we needed to support 12 states, 12 border states. Uh, commerce was backing up on the borders. Uh, three weeks of 
auto supplies that cross between Canada and the U.S. up in the Great Lakes were beginning to back up. Employers were beginning to have to lay off. The auto industry was ready to lay off people because they couldn't get parts. So we, we, the mission we got was to support coast, customs and border protection with close to 2,000 guardsmen. Again, what status? In this case, we had to come up with a new criteria, which was a federally paid for mission. So they are on federal active duty, working under their active duty counterparts, which we were going to mobilize uh, our forces. And then we had to detail them to customs and border protection. For a guardsman, it's pretty easy. That's what we do every day. We support someone in the community. In this case, we're supporting someone on the border. And uh, so another unique mission that came to us after 9-11. Somewhere in the early 2000s, and actually a little before 9-11, another very unique mission the Guard picked up, which we're doing today, is the missile defense, ground-based interceptors. 100% uh, operational arm uh, runs through National Guardsmen that are sitting right now, Fort Greeley, Alaska, uh, Schriever Air Force Base in Colorado, and Vandenberg, uh, the operational centers of those are both in Shriver and, and Greeley, and those are guardsmen that have been trained up, mostly air defense uh, skill sets, and they are the operational arm of our ground base interceptor. Even though General Jacoby is the, in, the individual who would, you know, would employ them, and the secretary and the president, but the people that sit there every day are guardsmen and women. As we moved on and we moved into Afghanistan, the Air Guard, right off the bat, had a huge uh, part to play. Uh, 22,000 Air Guardsmen, mostly mobilized, uh, and both strat lift, tactical lift moved them in, as well as fighters, 22,000. And then that number actually came down after the initial surge into Afghanistan in 2001, 2002 timeframe. Then in 2003, as we prepared to go across the border into Iraq from Kuwait, again, the Air Guard went up to 24,000, most of that mobilized uh, fighter capability, uh, Red Horse units to build up the uh, FOBs, uh, security forces going in, transportation. We started using the Air Guard for something completely different than in some cases of what their support personnel were, were designed to do, and they stepped up to the challenge and filled those requirements. So about 2003, the Army Guard, we had, we had been mobilizing a few up to that point, homeland missions, overseas missions. We had taken over the Kosovo mission for the Army they had asked us, and we took over the Sinai mission at that point. But about 2003, uh, 19 January, I remember the specific date, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld said, prepare the reserve component to augment the active, which for the National Guard at that point, it meant on the 19th of January, we alerted 21,000 troops. And we gave them anywhere from three days to seven days to pack up and move to their mobilization station, in some cases hundreds of miles away. And I will tell you that uh, some of the conversations I had with adjutants general were pretty amazing, but uh, they really took it as a huge challenge. Uh, first thing they had to do is make sure everything was in place all the records were in place, the medical piece was done, anyone that wasn't medically deployable, they got them out of the unit, they pushed in another person, caused uh, some disruption as far as cross-leveling. Additional uh, tasks that they had to accomplish uh, when they got to the MOB station was the train-up. Whatever tasks they were not prepared to do against the mission they were deploying to, they had to do that. So a lot of our units within 30 to 45 days of arriving at the MOB station, the smaller units, especially the company and some of the battalions, had to be certified, have their equipment loaded on the ship, and moving on a plane overseas to a staging area within 30 to 45 days. Shortly after that, we had a request from Forces Command to start looking at mobilizing brigades. So what we did was uh, we looked at our combat training center rotations, we looked at who had been deployed recently to a combat training center rotation, who was next up, and we picked six brigades and said, those are the brigades ready to go. And now, if you think about that, going from 39 days a year training, and now you're going to deploy, and you could be expected to do full spectrum operations, you need a bit more time. 
Uh, probably at that time, the average post-mobilization training time was about 110 to 120 days. I think if you figure on the far end, those units that weren't resourced at the higher end was probably closer to 150. But for the most part, three to, three to five months to certify the brigade, and all those units have to be certified by the Army before they can deploy, that they've got the right equipment, personnel, and they've accomplished all the training. So I, I throw all that out as how this transitioned uh, the Guard from a strategic reserve in the 60s and 70s, progressing through some initial changes in the 80s and 90s, and then deployment and full up now 12 years of uh, participation in overseas operations as well as the homeland. And I thought I would just give you a few of the numbers. Uh, the Army Guard has mobilized 510,000. Uh, you know, that's not, you know, we got 358,000. You know, some have had two deployments, some have had three, some have had four, some have had, you know, we've had the turnover where some haven't had any. And when I see those kids, they usually ask. Those young soldiers will say, when, when's my deployment? I want to go. The Air Guard, uh, I think the number I saw the other day uh, to date was uh, just right at 290,000 Air Guardsmen. Now, normally, their deployments are going to be shorter periods, four to six months, part of an AEF rotation. But some Air Guard have gone a year or longer. So, you know, well over 700, 800,000 Guardsmen have been used in this war. If you look at today, and this would have been unheard of 20 years ago. I pulled the numbers off of our report this morning. On federal duty today, we have 29,372 Guardsmen. Uh, 22,000 of those are deployed overseas. The others are either getting ready or just got back and they're going through their demobilization. In state active duty today and state status, we have uh, 3,290 guardsmen supporting the wildfires fight in Colorado, supporting the air control alert in Title 32 status, supporting the counter drug program in the southwest border. So we are very active today in many of these missions that we've been doing for years. State missions and the change that has occurred in the state, and I talked to that earlier about uh, Hurricane Andrew. The biggest problem we had after Hurricane Andrew and then the problem we had later on with Hurricane Katrina was unity of effort and unity of command. We did not have the systems in place to do that. About three to four years ago, uh, General McKinley and uh, Admiral Winnefeld, who was the commander of NORTHCOM at the time, came together and said, we need to work on this. They worked with Assistant Secretary of Homeland Defense and they came up with a structure called dual status commands. And a dual status command is usually a one star that will come from the state. We will run them through uh, tr training with FEMA so they understand the National Incident Management System. Uh, they will understand defense support to civil authorities. They will go through a JTF commander's course hosted by Northern Command. And then they will go through, they're designated by the, by the Adjutant General, they will go through a course of study and actually office visits with the senior leadership of both DHS as well as the military. Uh, and that dual status commander course then allows General Jacoby and I to certify them that they can command and control uh, active and guard and reserve troops. Today we have uh, at least one in every state. Most states have two, some have three of these dual status commanders. Last year we used these Folks, for unity of effort and unity of command, we used them probably six times. We used them for the NATO summit up in uh, Chicago. We used them for the Republican and Democratic National Conventions. Uh, we used them for the fires last year in Colorado. Uh, we use them for floods. Whenever a governor says, I might need some capability from the federal government, I'm going to stand up a dual status command. It takes one phone call or one email, and the secretary will approve it because the president has delegated that authority to put this individual in both Title 10 and Title 32. On the state side, Title 32, that dual status commander answers to his or her governor and adjutant general. On the Title 10 side, they report to General Jacoby and the president, Secretary of Defense and president. So we have been using this now. The first one was actually done in 2005, but we didn't use it much uh, in contingency operations till. Uh, Admiral Winnefeld and General McKinley met and said, we need to do something here uh, for contingency operations. So today it's the usual and customary way of doing C2 in the homeland. The most recent one was uh, 
over the weekend when the dual, or actually last week when the uh, dual status commander stood up for the far fights there in the Black Forest of Colorado Springs, where General Jacoby had brought in some forces from Fort Carson. Uh, the Colorado Guard brought in helicopters and security and engineers, and they teamed them up all under one commander. So I think I'm going to stop there. I uh, wanted to just give you a flavor of how we've progressed, but let me pose a few questions to you. So realizing we have invested, best equipped, best trained, best led guard today. We have the schools. We go to the same schools our active counterparts do. But given, given the budget constraints we have today and the fact that in the sequestration, $50, $50 billion, you pick the number, it was $37 billion, had to come out of uh, 494 or about $500 billion this year. Uh, next year, it'll actually even be deeper cut. What can the nation afford in its military? What can they put in the reserve component in the National Guard that can be ready at some time frame? You know, smaller units can be ready a lot quicker. Brigades might take a bit longer. It depends on how, what you can accomplish in 39 days a year. What can you afford when you, you pick the number of what the cost difference is? You know, some studies say cost, you know, you can buy one active unit for three reserve component units. You can buy one or four. Depends on how you look at that, but that's somewhere in that range, one and three or one and four. So what do you need on the ramp today to respond to a very uncertain world, by the way? if you look at the map of all the places that could flash at any time. But what can you put in your reserve component and keep it operational at some level, which, which is a cost. But when you look at the total budget, again, one in three, one in four. Also at a time when our budget, if you look at the manpower cost, the compensation, Dave and I were just talking about this a minute ago, uh, there's a report out there that says if, even if we weren't under the Budget Control Act, by 2021, 80% of the defense budget would be going to compensation if we didn't do something to change that. And again, going back to the reserve component being a small part. So my question to you is, what can the nation afford? What should the nation afford? And I try not to say one or the other, you know. I think there's a balance in there somewhere as a nation we have to find. And, you know, if, if we can't find that balance and we start giving up reserve component units, and we get into a major operation, uh, where are those folks going to come from? We're going to go back to a draft? We don't want to. You ask anybody in uniform, we don't want to do that. We've got the great, greatest uh, military in the world, and it's because it's an all-volunteer force. So I pose the question. Uh, be looking forward to any kind of comments you might have, and uh, looking forward to hearing for the future uh, anything you might have as you leave here and get a chance to spend some time with the director of the Air Guard, director of the Army Guard, and my vice. Thank you. General Grass, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm David Berto, CSIS. Uh, General Grass has agreed to take a couple of questions. We've already got a whole host of them coming in. So if you do have questions on your cards, hold them up. The uh, staff will come by and pick them up. Um, and we're going to save the easy ones for the panel. So I'm just going to give you a couple that, uh, that the, the, the panel itself is probably not uh, in as good a position. One is, of course, your role now as a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges and opportunities that, uh, that are afforded to the National Guard because of that new role? Sure. Thank, thanks, Dave. Well, first let me say that uh, it's quite an opportunity to serve as a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But that brings certain requirements that you better be ready to step up. And when Chairman Dempsey and, and General Lingell, my vice, when we're sitting in the tank sessions, uh, we don't get asked just about issues that deal with the Guard. We get asked to vote on every issue. You know, we voted on uh, moving forces from one COCOM to another. And we had input to that. We had input to women in service. Today we have nine guard brigades that are, are transitioning more skill sets to women in service to, uh, to have an opportunity for them to serve in a number of uh, our combat skills. We voted on same-sex marriage. Uh, any issue that comes up inside of the tank, we have a vote on. So the challenge there, though, is the National Guard Bureau staff hasn't had, in some cases, the opportunities to work at that level. So we're working very closely with the Army and Air Force to say, we've got great people, but there's some positions we need opportunities to fill. We need to ensure that everyone 
on the NGB staff, the National Guard Bureau staff, is focused at the strategic level. And we're doing a strategic realignment right now, which we're actually briefing later this week to the Adjutant General to say, okay, uh, Sid Clark and, and Bill Ingram, Air and Army Guard directorates, they do the operational, the tactical, the relationship with the state. We work very closely with the Adjutant General, but let's keep our focus at the strategic level so that when questions do come up, we've got the background. And the real value that I see that we have to provide for the chairman, for the president, for the Joint Chiefs, is how does, how does all this come together in the state when you, uh, when you have to uh, employ you know, 100,000 troops someday uh, to a New Madrid earthquake? How does that happen? How do we do that? That's just one example of some of the tough issues that lie ahead for us. I think also, the, as we look uh, to the future and the Joint Chiefs, I found that uh, during Hurricane Sandy, I didn't know exactly what I was getting into up front. Although I did what I always do, is immediately, immediately communicate with the Adjutant General, not just in the affected states, but surrounding states to have a better understanding of the status of their forces, the capability, uh, the readiness, how long would it take them to move in if a governor asked for under emergency management assistance compact, how long would it take them to get there? So I had that information flowing to me. I was talking to General Jacoby three, four, five times a day, looking at the Title X capabilities that were out there and what was, what was available. So I found there was real value added setting with Secretary Panetta and being able to provide that, that level of detail. Looking forward though, now we're getting into a thing called National Guard Strategic Planning System, which actually later today we're going to brief to Secretary Carter to say how do you identify uh, those more complex catastrophe events and something that is nested underneath General Jacoby's uh, ability, his, his XORD under the Defense Support to Civil Authorities, but how do I determine what the states need, working with the states, to respond to disasters? And you can pretty well pick across the country where those worst case scenarios are. But then I need to better understand the state requirements so I can come to the Pentagon, come to the Joint Chiefs, and vote wisely on future structure and resources for the Guard. Again, staying at the very strategic level. Thank you. That's a, a very, you know, it's kind of interesting that both you and Admiral Winnefeld come from NORTHCOM. You end up on the Joint Chiefs at the same time, at, just at a time that we need it the most. Second question, and, and then I'll, uh, uh, we'll let you get back to your duties and we'll bring the panel up. Um, in your posture statement for the year, you mentioned that we shouldn't rely too much on cost as the big driver of size and readiness of the National Guard, but that other factors should come into play. You've hinted at a couple of those factors in your talk this morning, but I wonder if you could elaborate a little on the additional factors that ought to be brought to bear to determine the size and the readiness of the Guard. Sure, sure. T two things. Let me start by saying that when we talk about cost, uh, I think the Army Guard today is about 9% of the Army's total obligation authority. I think the Air is about 6% of the total obligation authority for a significant percentage of the force. But that doesn't tell the full story, as my good friend Sid Clark will tell you and, and told me the other day. You, you cannot separate us from our Federal Reserve, oper our uh, Federal relationship with the Army and Air Force. Because the research and development we don't pay for. The equipment comes to us from the service through the acquisition programs. The training base for basic training. We don't run basic training. We do run some RTI facilities, some regional training institutes where we train active guard and reserve. But we, we really look to our service partners to give us that. So we are so tied on our federal mission to those services that sometimes the numbers can get lost a bit. So you have to take that into the equation when you start thinking about the split of the budget for the future. And the second question, uh, I think one of the things we will deal with in the future uh, as, we, as we get beyond the budget, the Guard brings tremendous value. And there's going to be new mission sets. And I told someone the other day, I was reading this thing in Popular Science about 30 years from now where you have, you won't, your platoon will be uh, robots. I mean, that may be far, far fletched, but the, uh, the technology is there today. And you think about what's just happened in 12 years with uh, unmanned aerial systems. I think there's a lot of opportunities for the Guard, both 
to continue to support our federal mission partners in the Air Force and Army and also to have that capability, that training and that command and control that we, we grow inside our leaders, uh, that we get that from our federal mission that we do every day and can provide support to the state. Uh, cyber. Cyber is an area that I think we're going to have huge uh, capability for the future. I was uh, Saturday visiting a unit here in Virginia that was in annual training. A division headquarters, uh, two-star command. They had this huge drash tent, they call it, sets up on about three acres. The networking in that facility was just phenomenal. And I went around and I talked to all the staff. They have the new CPOF communication, same thing they were using in Iraq and Afghanistan. But I was talking to the members of that unit that are in that division. On, they are in their annual training two-week period. They're halfway through. And the current ops chief, Colonel, works for ITT. He owns five patents on the night division goggle system in his civilian capacity. The network administrator inside the division, a captain, works for a large IT firm. In fact, he told me, he says, uh, You've really got some good stuff here in the military. So we have junk on my side of it. <laughs> but uh, what I found over and over is that skill set that our guardsmen and women bring is a real treasure that you can kind of find about any discipline you want uh, in addition to their military status. And they want to serve. They want to be challenged. So I see as we go forward, and in today's warfare, I mean, I remember uh, listening to a 4th Infantry Division brigade commander when he returned from Afghanistan. And one point he made was one-third of his mission was security. Two-thirds of his mission were infrastructure development, reestablishing uh, security forces, um, police forces, uh, water, you know, electric, you name it. So I think that's where the Guard has a great niche for the future because of our many skill sets. And I think these are the types of things we're going to deal with as we head down to in, into the future. Sir, it has been a, an honor and a privilege for us to have you here with us this morning. We're very grateful to you. Um, we're, we're delighted to be able to continue the conversation with the panel. But I ask you all to please join me in a round of applause. Thank you very much. We're now going to bring our panel up on the stage. If you want this opportunity to uh, replenish your coffee, not that we aren't going to keep you awake with our comments. Uh, uh, this is a good time to do that. So, generals, would you please join me up here on the stage? Thanks.
Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd please take your seats, we'll resume the program. This goes until 10.30, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So we'll keep our remarks very brief. Can we can, uh, leave time for questions? yeah, leave, leave a little time for questions. We can, we can run past it. We have a room till 11. All right, you guys got everything you need? All right, we'll, uh, we'll resume the program now. Uh, it's always a, a testament to the audience when the key speaker departs and the audience still remains. Um, I think that, though, in large part is due to the panel that we have following up here uh, this morning, and I, I will introduce them. Uh, they'll each have an opportunity to make some remarks, and then we'll turn to the questions. I have a few questions left over from from General Grass's commentary, but I know others are still pouring in. So if you don't have a, a card, uh, raise your hand and we'll get you a card. If you have a card and you've put a question on it already, raise your hand with the card and the staff will pick it up and bring it up here to our ABLE senior fellows, uh, Stephanie Sanek and Nate Fryer, who will uh, assemble and integrate them and make them harder for us. Um, I'm David Berto. I'm the Senior Vice President uh, here at the Center for Strategic International Studies. I'm the Director of the International Security Program. It's my real pleasure this morning to have uh, with me this morning uh, the three uh, generals who have to carry into action all those wonderful things that General Grass uh, talked about this morning. I'm a native of South Louisiana, and so I grew up with the Guard, and I saw the Guard primarily as the people who showed up when we had hurricanes coming. And we had them A through R. Um, I guess Sandy actually was here, and that was my S. That was my first S hurricane. But uh, starting, you know, Audrey, Betsy, Camille, Dominique, there was actually a hurricane named David. It took me a while to live that one down, all the way up through, through Rita. And in Louisiana, we actually activated the National Guard when the hurricane warnings went up. We didn't really wait until it hit, because, in fact, it was part of preparation and part of advancement. So for me, the Guard was a part of my life growing up, and it was a very important part of my life. Um, that's why I'm so pleased to be here today with the distinguished gentleman that we have up here on, on the stage. I'm going to introduce the three of them, then uh, they'll each take some uh, remarks, and then we'll open it up for questions. To my immediate left is Lieutenant General Joseph Lingell. He is the Vice Chief of the National Guard Bureau. Um, he came to this from a really easy job as a defense attache in Egypt. Uh, where nothing was going on at the time, and so it made it easy here. Uh, commissioned in 1981 through the Reserve Officer Training Corps out of North Texas State University in Denton. Next to, uh, to his left is Lieutenant General Bill Ingram, the Director of the Army National Guard, uh, his commission 1972 as a distinguished graduate from Officer Candidate School in what was then called the North Carolina Military Academy at uh, Fort Bragg. I don't even know if it's still in existence by that name, but we're still turning out an awful lot of fine soldiers there. He has been the Adjutant General of North Carolina and, of course, now as Director of the Army National Guard. He's responsible for guiding the, the formulation and development implementation of the programs and policies for the 350,000 National Guardsmen that General uh, Grass described. And uh, to the f his left is Lieutenant General Sid Clark, uh, Director of the Air National Guard. He's got responsibility for only a little over 100,000 uh, Air Guardsmen uh, and uh, across some 213 locations around the country and around the world. Commissioned in 1981, again, as a distinguished graduate of the Reserve Officer Training Candidate Program at the University of Georgia. Uh, he had a much easier assignment as defense attache. I think that was in Turkey. Uh, so, you know, nobody gets the, 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 the easy ones here like, uh, well, actually, I don't know where there are any easy ones anymore now that I think about it. So without uh, further ado, I'll turn first to General Ling Yell, and then we'll proceed uh, down the table. Thank you. Great. Good morning. Thank you, uh, everyone. It's an honor to be here. And uh, just the fact that the National Guard is here at this uh, August institution to talk about uh, our future and our potential capabilities to the Department of Defense says something about where the National Guard has come from. 
uh, over the past uh, 15 or 20 years or so. General Grass gave you a great rundown on, I think, uh, uh, the major events uh, and the transformation, really, of the National Guard over the last uh, 10 or 15 years or so and where we are, and I, I don't think anybody doubts the contribution that uh, we're making uh, to the national defense today. Uh, I thought I'd tell you just a, a couple things on what General Grass uh, has me focused on in the building with my, with my uh, colleagues up here, and, and that is how do we maintain this operational force that we have become. Um, you know, all the senior leaders uh, throughout the last uh, couple of chairmans have said that we've made a great investment in the National Guard uh, in, in terms of uh, in people, equipment, training. Uh, it's been engaged uh, operationally throughout the world uh, and remains so today, unlike ever before. And, uh, and, and we feel like that investment is something that uh, we want to maintain and we want to reap the benef benefits from it going forward. So. Four, four main parts that General Grass has me working on is maintaining this operational force. How do we get our fiscal uh, house in order? How do we maintain uh, the best bang for the buck that the National Guard is uh, a very lean institution anyway, but how do we go forward, become even, even more lean? Um, how do we uh, invest in our National Guard community of interest so that we can continue, continue to develop and, and transform to an even in better, more uh, able organization? Uh, that looks at uh, three things, the, the members themselves, uh, how do we become uh, developed to a point where we can uh, serve in various roles with our active component part counterparts uh, across uh, the department and the interagency to uh, get the positions up here where we actually can support a four-star position as a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, and finally, to, uh, to look ahead uh, to the future. Um, what is it that the National Guard needs to become, divest, transform? Uh, what new missions do we need to take on? Where, where are the best fits that we feel for the National Guard in the future uh, as we go forward? I think, um, you know, I, I come here today and, I, and I'm an optimist. When you, when you look across the, the street at the Pentagon from here, you, you, see, you tend to see this big black cloud sitting over it as uh, we talk about the woes of uh, having to find two, two, two billion dollars a week every week for the next 10 years uh, if uh, full se sequestration were to hit. That means we have to do things differently. Um, but I'll tell you that uh, because of this investment that we've made in the National Guard, um, I, I, I'm an optimist in that we have a, a tremendous uh, tool to use in the reserve component uh, going forward. Uh, never have we been more ready, never have we been more capable. Um, and as the financial burden comes across, I, I think it's entirely possible that, that we may have to find ways to leverage the combat capability and the contributions both in a federal and state sense. Um, to use the reserve components going forward. I think uh, it comes down to four, four major questions as to how much we can leverage that tool. General Grass touched on, on pretty much all of them. It always comes down to essentially um, can the National Guard or the reserve component get there fast enough? Um, the cost question, which uh, anytime someone can throw a number out there and tell you a certain, certain cost, someone can trump you and show you another number that shows you a different cost. So getting agreement on on what the cost is. One of, one of my favorite statements uh, that I'll steal from Dr. Patrick in the back was, was uh, never trust uh, any number that you have not manipulated yourself. And, and, and I think uh, we do that to each other routinely um, uh, in the Pentagon and, and sometimes not to the best interest of, of uh, the total enterprise. Next is access. What, when can we use the Guard? I think uh, one thing that has fundamentally changed about the National Guard is, is not only the use and the access to it, but the expectation that they will be used. 39 days is, is no longer uh, anybody's expectation in the Guard. And in fact, rather than, uh, as, as I watch some of the old, old TV shows and you talk about the National Guard as a, pay, as a place to serve as a refuge from combat, as a refuge from being in the fray, um, now it's anything but. People get in the Guard because they want to go break things. They get in the Guard because they want to travel. They get in the Guard because they want to be members of full spectrum decisive ag action combat units. Uh, and we're proud of that. And that's something that I think that should we make this, this transition at this point and decide not to do that, uh, it's going to have immense adverse impacts on the National Guard and our ability to recruit. So as you said, cleaning up after hurricanes, that's not what the National Guard is anymore, uh, not what they want to be, not what they're resourced to be, and certainly uh, not what they could be leveraged to be uh, in the future going forward. Although they are still damn good at it. They are still damn good at it. And every time you look out there and you see these soldiers on TV, whether it's uh, bombs uh, blowing up in Boston or hurricanes uh, in the Gulf or, or tornadoes in Moore, Oklahoma, the National Guard is there. And we're there, resource trained and equipped by our, our services, the Army and the Air Force. And, and that is a, is a unique uh, piece that the American people can leverage uh, in the 3,000 communities where the National Guard is out there. So um, 
Finally, the, the final question I think that, that sometimes is hard, harder to assess is, uh, is the National Guard force actually the same quality force? Is it the same uh, readiness force? And I think uh, the service of the National Guard and engagements, I, I think back to 2005 and uh, 15 BCTs in, in Iraq at the time, uh, eight of them were National Guard. And so I, I think that clearly they've been, uh, they have been uh, engaged at the highest level uh, across the spectrum of conflict. Um, I don't think the National Guard's tired. I, I don't think the National Guard is looking for an opportunity to take a knee. Um, I think the National Guard is, is engaged and, and ready to stay engaged uh, in the future at an even greater rate. So with that uh, being said, I, I am an optimist. I think uh, right now that uh, the National Guard is poised to make a, a great contribution to the national defense and uh, remain so uh, in the future. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to my colleague, Bill Ingram. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, it's an honor, really, to join you today. I'm proud to represent the 358,000 soldiers in the Army National Guard of the United States. Uh, today's Army National Guard is honestly the best man, best trained, best equipped, best led organization that we've ever had in our 376 year history. Uh, right now, 25,000 of our soldiers are mobilized across the world including uh, 10,000 that are in uh, OEF today. Uh, since 9-11, there have been more than uh, 520,000 mobilizations of National Guard soldiers. At the same time, the Guard soldiers continue to fulfill obligations to our communities. Uh, last year, the Army Guard uh, served over 447,000 man days, duty days, conducting state missions, and actually that was a historically slow year for us. The one message I'd like to leave with you today is that citizen soldiers will continue to play a pivotal role uh, defending our states, the territories, as well as the nation. To this end, we work every day to strengthen the Army National Guard's 21st century capabilities. Uh, the evolutionary path that we've taken over the past 12 years really underscores that fact. The value of the National Guard was recently reinforced in a letter uh, written on the 5th of June to Congress on behalf of the state governors that encouraged Congress to fully utilize the National Guard's cost effectiveness and high skill level to maintain critical capabilities for the federal government and the states while reducing the overall size and cost of our nation's military. As the governors point out, utilizing today's Guard is an essential element in our nation's defense. Our strengths are based on four key elements. First, the Army National Guard is cost effective. A range of Department of Defense and independent studies that have already been mentioned confirm that an Army National Guard soldier delivers operational impact and strategic depth at about a third of the cost of his active uh, component counterpart. In terms of sheer scale, the Army National Guard contributes 39% of the Army's operating forces for 12% of its budget, complementing the active Army and the Army Reserve and providing vital capability to the total force. With these forces, the Army National Guard serves as the military's first responder for domestic emergencies, while also providing a balanced force for employment overseas. And I can't underscore that enough. Uh, the, the reason that the Guard is good at doing the domestic mission is because we're man-trained, equipped, and organized uh, by federal forces, as federal forces, and we provide um, the Army National Guard provides a combat reserve of the Army. Uh, the Army Reserve does other things, but uh, the, the preponderance of the combat forces and the reserve components of the Army are in the Army National Guard. Second, the Army National Guard responds rapidly. Past dozen years of war have demonstrated that even the largest guard formations can be trained to standard, validated, and deployed well within the timelines required by combatant commanders. The experience of deploying uh, repeatedly over the past decade has honed this training regimen and significantly reduced post-mobilization training time. The Army National Guard, uh, the Army Force Generation Cycle provides a rotating pool of about 55 to 60,000 Army Guardsmen in their ready cycle available for employment each year. Most companies and company size uh, units complete their post-mobilization training in approximately 30 days. Uh, brigade combat teams take a little longer. 
uh, averaging 50 to 80 days of post mode training. And again, it all depends. The, the active Army takes about that long as well, depending on what level you go into that training regiment. If you go in at platoon, it takes a little longer. Uh, if you go in at company level train, it doesn't take quite as long. And while predictability of scheduled deployments is preferable for soldiers, families, and civilian employers, the last decade has made the Guard more ready to respond to no notice overseas contingencies than we ever were in the past. Third, uh, the Army National Guard is accessible. Lessons learned in nearly 12 years of mobilizing and deploying soldiers have enabled the Department of Defense to collectively refine processes and procedures for employing the reserve component. Army National Guard has answered the call and accomplished the mission time and again without fail. Fourth, the Army National Guard is fully capable. Whether it's brigade combat teams conducting full spectrum operations in Iraq or Afghanistan, or small units and individuals executing security cooperation missions and exercises other places in the world, the Army National Guard has accomplished every mission that's been assigned. Perhaps this was most evident during Katrina 80,000 Guard soldiers were deployed overseas, and another 50,000 soldiers from every state, territory, and the district uh, converged upon the Gulf Coast to, uh, and they were there in time to support re rescue as well as recovery operations. Governors across the nation have depended on our units to save lives and properties in the face of danger and disaster for decades, for years and years and years. These inherent Army National Guard strengths are a direct result of decades of deployments and, again, the cumulative experience that we've, that we've gained in, in the war fight for the last 12 years. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today, and I'll turn over to, uh, to Sid. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I always feel welcome when you come to a place, particularly when it smells like pancakes when you walk in the door, so <laughs> glad to be here. Um, a lot of numbers were already thrown out, a lot of uh, description of about the Air National Guard, what we are, who we do, what we do, and um, where we're at. Uh, again, uh, a little over 105,000 uh, outstanding airmen serving um, in the Air National Guard. Uh, a lot of those are former members of the regular Air Force. Uh, the largest gift that I think that the regular Air Force gives the Air National Guard are fully trained, experienced personnel for one reason or another have elected to leave the regular Air Force and uh, have come to work in the Air National Guard. And they found a home and they love it and uh, are very happy to be uh, members of uh, the National Guard. We're 89 wings. We're in all 54 states, territories, and the district, as uh, General Grass had pointed out. We have uh, mission types that extend across the entire United States Air Force portfolio. Every single core function that the Air Force does, we're a part of it. And uh, I think we do it very well. And I'll talk to a little bit why I think we do it very well in just a minute. The other thing I wanted to talk about uh, that I think is important is readiness. The Air Force years ago made the decision that its reserve components, both the Air Force Reserve and the Air National Guard, would be as ready as their uh, regular Air Force members when it came time to go to war. That was a huge investment, big decision. that went well beyond just talking about a volunteer force. It was about how would they posture their forces to commit to a combat environment because of that, we have outstanding cooperation when we go overseas. Seamlessly, we work side by side. You'll hear multiple times when people tell you that they can't tell the difference between a member of the Air Force Reserve, the Air National Guard, or the regular Air Force when we're serving together. That is the starting point for any discussion as we go forward. When we talk about active component and reserve component, if you want to talk about what can we do, what can we change, one thing that has to be the foundational understanding is the Air National Guard can do any mission that it's tasked to do if it has the proper resources and you set the expectations high enough. Joe talked to that just a little bit, the expectation. That's a big part of it. I would tell you that years ago we also were included in everything when it came to professional military education, things like sending our Air National Guard members to the fighter weapons school. Things like that made a big impact on the Air National Guard when it came to our readiness levels. So today we still have very high readiness and the Air Force values that in many ways. Basically, it's a, it's a somewhat of a core value of the Air Force to be as ready as possible when called upon to do whatever mission you're asked to do. So we've been very fortunate in being included in that. 
I also wanted to talk a little bit about the operational force. Um, in fact, I think it's key, and I'll mention uh, my pillars here in a second of the total force, but as members of the total force, the, the, the readiness along with the, uh, the idea that the expectation you will be an operational force is big because our members will look forward to the opportunity to serve side by side with regular for Air Force Airmen or in missions they're tasked to do individually, including air defense over the nation every day uh, when we talk about future uh, discussions on force structure. Uh, they are very happy when they're deployed. The proudest conversations you'll see or have with members of the National Guard is when they've been deployed side by side with their other total force brethren doing a mission for the nation. They're also very proud when they do their missions at home. When guardsmen are helping pull things off of houses and, and looking for uh, victims in uh, tornadoes, earthquakes, the, uh, the Hurricane Sandy, you will see another piece of pride come out of guardsmen when they perform those missions at home. It's a unique structure. Title 32, Title 10. But the pride that comes with being able to serve the federal mission in the states is quite unique. And very, I'm proud to be uh, the one member of that, not just the director of the Air National Guard. The big change to me for the operational force came in the 90s. We were asked to step up and be a part of the Air Expeditionary Force. That is, going back to that foundational understanding that if you're going to do a mission, be as good as anybody else in the, with, with regard to the components that serve in the service. We were put on the first string, basically, when it came to the Air Expeditionary Force. That was profound, and people stepped up to it. They realized that meant rapid, more deployments, more time away from home, but that was the beginning. And that folded into the last decade when we served in Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom. I think in the future, I see no difference. I see guardsmen very proud to serve in that operational force. I see them uh, being supported by their families. I see them being supported by their employers. There are four pieces, uh, four pillars, if you will, to the total force. The first one is standards. We all meet the same standards in the Air Force. You can't tell the difference between an F-22 pilot in the Air National Guard and one in the regular Air Force. That's because the Air Force set that uh, template, if you will, for how we would be construct, uh, structured and meeting the same standards is one part of it. The section one, second one is inspections. We all meet the same inspections. That's important. If you expect to be tier one ready, ready to go out the door on day one, whatever mobilization time it takes, whether it's two days, three days, a week, be ready to go. There's no going off to another location to get ready. You got to leave your in garrison location and go forward right now. The third part is, uh, of the uh, pillars is the operational force I was talking about. That's the expectation piece, that you will do this, either in rotational demand, whatever that is. Uh, right now it's a one to three for the regulars, one to five for the reserve components. That's an expectation that you will meet. If that rotational demand is there, then you have to step up to that. Of course, if there's a bigger conflict and different mobilization authorities required, then you'd be ready to go. And it could significantly change the, the life of a uh, guardsman for one to three years. It's gonna be a big deal if that happens, but we're ready to do that. Anybody wears this uniform in the Guard has to understand that. And the fourth pillar is resourcing. That makes the first three happen correctly. So when it comes to the recapitalization efforts, the modernization efforts, the mandates to support the operational force, they have to be there. Pull all that together, you got a great total force, you got a great team. We talked about the efficiencies, cost factors, and others and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have along with the rest of the panel. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, all three of you. That was a very uh, uh, well-rounded survey, if you will. Uh, as the moderator, I'm tempted to ask all the questions because I have about 40 of them here, but I'm only going to ask one, and then I'm going to turn to our, uh, to our associates here to catch uh, some of the questions that you all have been circulating. Again, if you, if you still have questions uh, written on your cards, raise them up, and the staff will, will collect them. I want to tackle the readiness issue because all of you touched on it, and, and it, it seems to me that for active forces, readiness questions are fairly linear. How much money do you have? Where are you going to cut? Who comes in first? The whole question of, of first tier and, and below, is it okay? Can we live with the consequences? For the Guard, this is a harder dynamic. The questions are, are more complicated. It's not only readiness for what, but you've got to balance uh, federal responsibilities and state responsibilities. You hinted at that in your comments. You have to also, I think, 
think about how you compensate for a less ready active component, which adds a complexity to your situation they're probably not looking at uh, uh, in the other direction. So how do you deal with those challenges? And really, this, I guess, is a question for, for all three of you. Well, I think, uh, you know, clearly the issue of the day is readiness. I, I think the discussion, uh, as we've had in the Pentagon over the recent weeks in terms of uh, how do we go far forward and all the analysis on where is there money to be saved, once you have the force built and the equipment bought and the people trained, you know, readiness uh, is incrementally caught. I mean, when you, when you start to adjust readiness, um, there aren't huge, huge dollar savings there that you can get to immediately. Uh, it's, it's, it's relatively constant. For us in the Guard, I, I, would, I would offer that our readiness problems are no different than the active component where you take, uh, you, you look at, at people, training, facilities, and equipment. Uh, all of those things impact our readiness. And we tend to defer the um, thing that we cut things first that don't actually impact our ability to go out and, and save people's lives. And that's, you know, we, we let our buildings start to decay. We let our equipment become less ready. And then over time, this begins to snowball, as I'm sure Sid and Bill will tell you, and it becomes harder and harder and more expensive to, to dig ourselves out of it. So our questions are the same. When we look at a drill weekend, uh, th those are the periods where we increase our readiness at, in our 39 days. For the Army National Guard, it costs about $300 million to bring all 350,000 of Bill's soldiers in, $300 million to bring them on and, and put them on a, on a drill weekend for, for readiness. It's much less than that for, for the Air National Guard, much less people. So it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an expensive uh, proposition in order to do it. And so however ready, ready you want to be, that's how much money, money we have. So it's, it's I think, uh, you know, the question going forward. We're looking at, in the National Guard perspective, we're looking at our ability to react both on the federal side and the state side um, and determine what kinds of equipment and people do we need to keep ready. General, General Grass touched on the National Guard uh, strategic planning system as as we look at various states and various catastrophes that may happen uh, to, to determine what are the most important things that we keep ready in order to respond to those kinds of things. That I'll let Bill. Okay, thanks, Joe. I, I absolutely agree with what you said. Uh, one thing I think to point out is that federal readiness for the federal mission and readiness for state missions really don't compete with each other. Uh, you heard General Grass talk today about uh, visiting the 29th Infantry Division and their headquarters was set up with the with the CPOF and the drash tents and they were they were ready to do business. But it doesn't really matter if they were doing a, uh, a state mission doing command and control for a New Madrid earthquake or whether they were in Iraq or Afghanistan uh, doing a, a combat mission. The skill sets that you use are, are almost the same and uh, the ability to train I think when you talk about readiness, you can only be as ready as you're resourced. So as, um, as we move into this next era of reduced resources, uh, we're going to have to be very careful about how we pick and choose uh, what, what training uh, exercises that we do. And everybody in the force, you know, the Army with their uh, r for gen the Army Force Generation model, is really a, is a, is a methodology for having cyclic readiness. Uh, we were uh, training and equipping and uh, preparing for the next to deploy to uh, either Afghanistan or Iraq. And we focused resources on the next to deploy units. Uh, in the case of Arfrogen for the Army National Guard, it's uh, an available cycle of one year in, in every five. Uh, and we're still looking to do that level of, uh, that level of, of resourcing. So we'll have about a fifth of the force, which again is about 60,000 soldiers that are in their available cycle uh, every year. And the type of forces that are in that available year are a cross section of the Army National Guard uh, of combat units, combat support, combat service support units. Uh, that's our be ready for the, for the federal mission, uh, which has us ready for the state mission as well. Uh, the state mission is the fight tonight mission, so we have to be careful with dual use equipment so that we keep that equipment uh, ready as it can be based, again, on resources um, for whenever we're called for the, um, for the response to things like Hurricane Sandy or the, or the tornadoes or the, or the fires, or fires during the uh, season. 
with that, I'll turn it over to Sid. Yeah, the uh, the question, David. I think you kind of reflected on the regular uh, forces and their their readiness. Uh, the chief staff of the Air Force and the secretary of the Air Force are committed to whatever size the Air Force is, and however we're composed, we'll keep the readiness high. So their their commitment is to keep that readiness up there. We've seen times when it's dropped down. Now, as of recently, we had to uh, in the Air Force had to ground some squadrons due to sequestration and the uh, OCO bills that had to be paid and that hurt readiness no doubt but I think that's a tremendous also complement to the reserve components because we continued to fly in the reserve components uh, due to different appropriations but I think the confidence that the regular Air Force has in the Guard and Reserve if the nation calls and will step up and uh, will we'll respond I, th I would hope that we all maintain the same level of readiness in the uh, out years can I just uh, add one more point it, this goes to the operational use of the reserve component. There is a certain readiness that comes from using that force in an operational sense. And, and so when we actually go to Sinai or we go to Bosnia or we go to Horn of Africa as an operational force, that replaces otherwise, in, in some cases, training that someone has to spend extra dollars to do. And that's one reason why we find it, it's so imperative that the National Guard stay operationally involved. We stay current. We stay networked with the operational forces that we engage with and it helps maintain us at a higher level of readiness while doing an operational mission. Good, thank you. Um, let me turn now to the questions from the audience. Uh, Nate Fryer, Stephanie Sanek, our two senior fellows. I, I assume you all have organized yourselves and, and have an order to proceed, so let me turn the mic over to you. Thank you very much for being here, gentlemen. Um, I, th I think this question applies across the board. Uh, it's, it's, again, kind of a amalgam of a couple of questions that came in from the audience. Um, first, I, I'd say, what are the current, as we reset from Iraq and Afghanistan and look to the future and deal with a, an era of increasingly tight resources, what are the acquisition priorities for the Guard, uh, uh, in particular the two components, and then overall sort of as you look, look forward? And then at the same time, where are there areas that <clears throat> we can take some risk where are there are areas that uh, that were, were oversubscribed, perhaps in capability, um, and where are there areas that you really want to cover down on risk? Sure, I'm going to take it on. Uh, well, in the, the last part of your question about where do you take risk, you know, one of the th discussions that uh, obviously we're going to have is probably about the active component, reserve component mix. Um, I think one of the foundational questions you have to ask yourself is what threats do we face now? What threats do we face in the future? Does the United States face an existential threat? Do we face one in 10 years? Do we face one in 20 years? And that gets back to what uh, General Lingale brought up a while ago about how big a force do we have or need? How, big a for how, how fast that force have to get to the fight? And how long is that uh, force going to stay there and employ? So I think that's uh, one part of the uh, the assumptions and the questions you have to ask you about what you're going to do in the future. Your, your question had to do with, again, where do we take risk, but what are our acquisition priorities for the future? Um, we have to be, again, careful because of our dual mission. Uh, we need to have the equipment available and in, in a, a readiness level that it's available. Uh, to do the domestic mission and the way the Army National Guard is arrayed across the 54 states territories in the district uh, we have a, a mix of of capabilities in each state and all disasters and all emergencies are local so the governor is in charge is, is what it really amounts to so the National Guard has to have certain capability and, and again available capability in each state uh, for the for the domestic mission. Uh, on the other side, a brigade combat team is a brigade combat team is a brigade combat team. Uh, a, the Striker Brigade and the Army National Guard are one of the infantry uh, brigade combat teams. Uh, again, in the, the readiness cycles, we're still going to do uh, for the foreseeable future the same things that we've done for the last 10 years, 12 years, uh, in being ready for the war fight. So, uh, resources will be 
centered and focused on the on the units that are in the available cycles as a as a training model uh, moves forward. Before we get to our question, um, I wanted to note that a lot of the cards that Nate and I have been receiving have um, the first line of them have, has read, thank you for your service. So I think not only is the smell of this room welcoming, but uh, things are emanating towards, that, towards you guys that um, really there, there, there's a lot of appreciation for everything that you've done. My question is a little bit um, more about cybersecurity. The guard straddles um, between, in many cases, between the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security, engagement with FEMA, federal coordinating officers, and, and the like. I think cybersecurity and cyberterrorism is an area where a lot of people are talking about what is the risk that's acceptable. Um, can I ask, and it was reflected on several of the cards that we received, the role of the guard in approaching cybersecurity and cyberterrorism. When you look out in the next 20 years, how will the guard play in that arena? Thank you. Well, I'll see if I can hit the wave tops and then turn it over and let the Army uh, National Guard and Air National Guard talk about their service things. Um, clearly, there's a lot of, lot, lot of discussion in the Pentagon about cyber enterprise in general. Uh, one thing to consider about it as, as we have in, and we engage in all these discussions about what uh, is the current active component, reserve component mix and across the air domain, the land domain, the sea domain, all the rest of those stuff. I'd like to make the point that as we begin to build the cyber domain, really, uh, and we've been engaged in cyber activities for quite some time, but we're just really getting serious about putting together a, a, a force model, a cyber mission force for the support of U.S. Cyber Command from all the services. Uh, we have an opportunity to build it uh, kind of from the ground up and think through where the best places are to put the cyber uh, piece in the reserve component. Um, you know, I think uh, one thing that has kind of been touched on across several speakers has been uh, the unique attributes and civilian skill sets that are resident in the reserves um, and the, the capabilities where people with unique cyber skill sets are able to, uh, to bring sometimes the, the newest leading edge um, capabilities in the, in the cyber domain uh, too. Uh, they're they're well-trained, they're, they're already in it, they understand it. The other thing we think, and we are concerned from a state and a FEMA and a DHS and a, and a state level is, where do we expect uh, the cyber attacks to hit? Oftentimes we think, well, will they come after us or will they go after the, uh, no, the, the networks of the banks and the systems and the pieces that are going to hurt our economy or our power grids or all those things that are actually out there in the, in the civilian sector. So we feel like uh, National Guardsmen who work in these sectors, uh, reservists in general, will have sometimes um, the first look and ability to see those things, identify them, fix them, and, and go in and, and clean them up. I think um, uh, the challenges that we're going through right now is, is that we think it's important that whatever it is that we build in the, in the reserves and in the National Guard is, we feel it's important that it mirror uh, the Title X capability, the same standards and training that General Clark and General Ingham have talked about before, and, and so, that, so that we are integral and replaceable for pieces of the federal Title X uh, mission domain. And um, so that, a lot of ongoing discussion with how we build that and how the National Guard can contribute to it. I'll turn it over to Bill and Sid. Thanks, Joe. Picking up on that, um, right now we have Army National Guard soldiers that are working uh, as soldiers at NSA and have been for the last 10 years, actually. Um, there are a couple of units in the Army National Guard that are um, that are deployed and work in, in the cyber arena. Uh, but they're very small and they're very selective. Uh, obviously, the civilian acquired skills is, is, a, perfect, is a perfect match for the Guard. Um, the real question is about authorities, and that's being worked out at, uh, at U.S. Cybercom and, and other places, is do soldiers have the authority to, uh, to get into the networks of uh, civilian corporations, for example, uh, in the banking industry and, and the power grid and others. Um, there, there's a lot of reluctance and, and how do we, if we attack, a, a, if we attack another country by back, you know, by backtracking who's attacking or who is, uh, is trying to get into our networks, is that an act of war? Is, does the Congress need to be involved? Uh, there, are, there are a lot of really fundamentally large questions dealing with cyber, um, getting down into the tactical part, leaving that and going to tactical. 
uh, any units that we have in the Army National Guard um, because of doctrine and uh, training and others uh, need to look like units that are in the active Army. And honestly, the Army is working very diligently right now. Uh, we're standing up some units uh, at the direction of U.S. Cybercom. All the services are uh, to fulfill that need. Uh, from the Army's perspective, cyber is a combination of signal intelligence and operations, and you combine those um, G2, G3, and G6 um, disciplines together to come up with cyber. Uh, so the Army's still working on what their cyber structure is going to look like for the future as they downsize, and it takes people, uh, it takes training, uh, figuring out what the MOSs are going to be, the military occupational specialties, uh, for people that are in the cyber uh, arena is something that's still uh, still being worked out. Whatever the, uh, the active Army stands up for cyber units, the Army National Guard will, will have similar units, again, spread across the, the 54 states, territories, and the district. As an aside to that, uh, they will, in a in a non-Title X status, they may be available to uh, for, for state or domestic missions, uh, depending on how they're called and, and what authorities are available. Sometimes, not often in the Pentagon, you'll see one slide that brings remarkable clarity to a subject when you ask about the people uh, in the mission. Uh, I have a slide, and if I had it with me, I'd show it to you, but it's one of our network warfare squadrons and there's over 30 different company icons and agencies that guardsmen work for in their civilian world that do IT. Not that they just work for these companies, but they actually do IT things related to that company. And when you think about that for the individual, that's tremendous networking that you get when you get together with all of those different companies on a regular basis. And it's a great value to the uh, to the nation that we have these people that serve in that capacity. And then I put an employer hat on and I went, okay, so at least once a month and more often likely, you're gonna bring all these people together and they're gonna share ideas on information technology, computer network defense, and how to do things. That's such strength. What a fabric that makes uh, for security. So if I was, in fact, if I was the employer and had one of those individuals in the squadron, I'd probably try to figure out how I get more of my employees in that squadron. Yeah, not only are you going to task organize them and let them serve with pride, professionalize them even further, but also that networking piece is big. big. So cyber has a natural place with the guard. Uh, gentlemen, um, there's been a, there are a number of questions on the, the transition from strategic to operational reserve or the maintenance of the guard's capability as an operational reserve. So I think it would be useful to hear um, some specifics on your specific goals with how to maintain sort of the edge the Guard has achieved over the last uh, decade, um, what your priorities in that re regard are. And really, I'd, I'd really like to readdress and ask if, if there is some tension now as, as the active component is certain to decline, if there is some tension between the Title 10 and Title 32 mission with respect to this increasing, uh, the increasing interest in maintaining the operational reserve focus. Everybody loves tension. Um, you know, I go back to, uh, to, to our, what we've kind of all been saying is, is our capabilities to do our state mission comes from our ability to do the federal mission. Uh, we, are, we are organized, trained, and equipped as a combat reserve for the United States Air Force and the United States Army. And when you do that well and when we have those capabilities, we are able to then cross, cross walk those capabilities. We call them the essential <coughs> 10 capabilities. I'm not going to name them all for you, but think of everything we use in the homeland, the medical, the transportation, the maintenance, the logistics, all of those things that enable us to uh, respond in the homeland sense uh, come from our ability and, and resourcing to do our, our Title X mission. That's, that's hugely important. When, when we look at what is it specifically that we're looking at readiness, sure, we're trying to identify as we talk to an Army and an Air Force with reduced resources, specifically what is it we need in terms of 
combatant commander exercise uh, engagements? What is it specifically we need in terms of active man years of operational use of the National Guard to maintain us at a readiness level where we feel we can maintain this combat benefit that we've leveraged over the last 15 years to what we have now? We feel like uh, General Grass touched on the state partnership program when he was here, but the operational engagement that we get by doing some of the engagements with our state partnership and our partners uh, is, is amazing and, and leverages our readiness uh, to, to really a whole nother level. Um, this, uh, I'll talk about the 65th partner we just did in, in, in Vietnam. Uh, in March, I was given a speech at a dining inn in San Antonio, which was the 40-year celebration of the release of the prisoners of war from coming back from Vietnam, one of which was my dad, who happened to spend six years as a guest of the state of, of the Vietnamese. Uh, a week later, I am talking to uh, the Vietnamese who want to talk to us about how we exercise together to do uh, search and rescue operations and defense support of, of civil authorities, all things that we are experts at in the National Guard. So that's how we try to tie these programs together, to, uh, to, which is, as General Grass said, $13 million, to give us engagements out and beyond and across the enterprise that maintain us a higher operational force and still at a reduced cost of the cost-benefit business model of the part-time military force. Turn it over to Bill. It's real, the tension is all about money. Uh, when an active guard or when a, a guardsman is on active duty, it costs the same amount of money uh, out of a, uh, from the Army or the Air Force as it does to have a, a regular Army or Air Force soldier or airman on duty. So uh, in a time of diminishing resources, in a time of downsizing for the, uh, for the United States Army, uh, the more Army National Guardsmen that are on duty every day uh, is, uh, diminishes the number of active duty soldiers that you could pay for with the same amount of money. So there, that's where the tension is. Uh, there's no question that uh, being operational <laughs> Uh, enhances the capabilities of the National Guard in general and certainly the people that are involved. It's leader development, it's the opportunity to, to get out of the state and see what goes on in the, in the active uh, or actually in, in the big world. So uh, operational is good. Uh, that can be uh, serving in a, uh, building partner capacity somewhere in the world and working for a combatant commander. It's just as valuable uh, to do humanitarian uh, missions in South and Central America. We do a lot of that. We've done that since the 80s. General Grass talked about that. Um, it's also anything that you're doing, uh, that you're exercising command and control, uh, training missions. Uh, we have done in the past a lot of uh, annual training missions, uh, OCONUS, uh, specifically in Europe. Uh, where our maintenance units have gone to uh, gone to some of the depots and uh, that we main, that the United States maintains uh, in Europe and fix stuff for for a couple of weeks. Uh, the ability to get outside and, and exercise command and control in a place that you're not used to uh, helps in operationalizing the guard. Uh, National Training Center, JRTC, other uh, training opportunities, again, where you train like you fight, uh, are also great opportunities, and we want to continue to do that. Uh, I'll, I'll turn it over. What tension? Uh, <laughs> um, I think, you know, I think your question had to do with tension between Title 32 and Title 10 with regard to performing the missions, or is it? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, I, I haven't seen it actually in that that world. I mean, it's it's like we said, we train for that federal mission, and I would tell you, there's some tough scenarios that expands the, the that operational engagement that we've been talking about that we think is important that operational force. I think it seasons our leaders, it seasons our people so that we face disasters at home, we perform well at those. I think it's important that the governors have those forces. In Air National Guard, you wouldn't think that we do as much with, as the Army National Guard does in disasters at home, but uh, we do quite a bit. It's because we have people that are pulled forward that know how to task organize, they take orders, they follow direction, 
and in the most extreme cases where we have uh, tough situations. And being from South Louisiana, David, you know, down there, they, uh, we had guardsmen waiting through places where it wasn't very pleasant, to tell you the truth, uh, that, that caused uh, the need for people to even go seek uh, some psychological counseling after some of the stuff they had seen. Not everybody, but in some cases. That, that's pretty desperate. I mean, that's some of, some of the stuff that you would see overseas in combat. So uh, I think it's important that uh, uh, we continue to train towards that federal mission, be as good as we can at that mission, because then that enables us to do that state mission very well. And I just, I'm not familiar with the tensions between Title 32 mission and Title 10 mission. We're reaching the, the end of our, of our time here. One of the things, of course, that the, the Guard is very good at readiness, and that is that uh, at getting governors to uh, sign letters uh, at the drop of a hat of any sign of tension. Some of you have seen this come to play. Uh, I recall back on uh, Friday the 13th, May of uh, 2005, when Secretary Rumsfeld released his list of base closures, there were four states uh, that had an F-16 Air National Guard base that I'm pretty sure on May the 12th, the governors of those states didn't know they had a base by the evening of May the 13th, it was the last thing that stood between the collapse of civilization and the saving of those, uh, of those F-16 bases. So this, these things have a way of focusing themselves. I, I want to have a number of thanks that I'd like to put out. I'd like to thank our panel uh, for staying through and, uh, and, and uh, giving us their insights and their expansive views, if you will. I'd like to thank General Grass for his uh, attendance and his speech here this morning. I particularly want to note one thing that he brought up, and that is the National Guard Youth Challenge, which uh, uh, is a, an exemplary program. It's been around for more than 20 years, um, but this month is the 20th anniversary of the statutory uh, entitlement or, or uh, uh, creation for that program. And in two days in this room, uh, CSIS will be hosting the National Guard Youth Challenge Program in commemoration of that 20th anniversary event. I would invite you all to check your calendars and to be back. I think General McKinley, uh, the 26th Chief of the National Guard Bureau, will be here as our, as our uh, lunchtime speaker or our lunchtime panel director, et cetera. And so uh, it's a really tremendous, tremendous success story all across America that could be replicated over and over again. And I want to thank all of you for, uh, for being here with us and sitting here today. And finally, I want to reiterate uh, Dr. Hamry's thanks at the beginning to our underwriters for this Military Strategy Forum series, uh, Rolls-Royce North America. Thank you very much for your continued support so that we can uh, continue to have these discussions and forums and bring them. Thanks to our viewers on the web. Thanks to all of you. And thanks to you, gentlemen. Thank you very much.